Hello and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. In this video, we are going to dive deep into everything that we know about the Mercedes EQS. Now, I have to say a huge thank you to Daimler Mercedes-Benz for providing interviews and behind-the-scenes content and tons of information that they were able to share for this video. It was really nice of them to get us everything, and now we can make an everything we know about the EQS before we're able to drive it. So, let's go through everything we know about the electric S-Class. <laughs> Everyone knows the Mercedes S-Class has been the benchmark luxury sedan for years, and now there is an electric version. But the combustion car is going to stay on its own path. The S-Class of SUVs, the GLS, will go down its own path, and now the EQS, the electric S, will go down its own path. So we'll have three different cars in the S-Class segment from Mercedes-Benz, the regular S-Class, the GLS, and of course the EQS. That is the one we're focusing here. EQ denotes an electric version of the vehicle, or I should say an electric ground up design from Mercedes. The EQS is built on a ground up modular architecture that basically can be scaled battery pack size as well as vehicle architecture to match EQC, EQE, EQS, uh, electric uh, SUV uh, versions can all be built on this chassis. And it's really gonna be paving the way for the future of Mercedes EVs. So it's very important that we dive into the design ethos, build quality, uh, uh, targets for battery charging motors, things like this, as well as the car hitting all of the S-Class marks you would expect. A comfortable interior, class leading technology, pushing the limits as far as design goes. This is gonna be pretty interesting. It's gonna be a long video. I'll have it broken up into modules. So you'll see in the pinned comment chapters that you can scroll to, as well as uh, if you're watching natively on YouTube, you can just scroll through the individual chapters. Uh, this is everything we know currently. It's not everything you will be able to know about the car, but we do have quite a bit of information. But of course, there's still plenty to learn about this car. I'm gonna be seeing it in person. We're gonna be driving it, but all of this is to come down the line in the future. I'm excited for this car. It's coming fall 2021 to the US and uh, the range looks really good. Everything looks good. So let's get into it. Can't wait. We're going to start with the battery pack to dive deep. The EQS has a lithium ion battery concept that is modular, efficient and innovative. The battery system can be flexibly equipped with pouch or hard case cells and, depending on the variant, enables a range of up to 770 kilometers. The in-house developed battery software enables technological over-the-air updates. In this way, the energy management of the EQS will also remain up to date in the future. Let's talk about the battery first off. So battery pack is 107.8 kilowatt hours usable, really sizable battery pack. Installed capacity is around 113 kilowatt hours. So there's a nice buffer there, but really not too much. Uh, and we'll see if Mercedes has a uh, guidance as to how deep they want us to charge every day. If it's an 80% limit, 90% limit. Um, we'll, and we'll, we'll definitely look into that when we get to play around with the car in person. But it's a 400 volt system architecture that's totally modular. Again, the EQS is the longest car on this chassis. So with smaller iterations and different battery pack sizes, they can basically just add or subtract bricks. Kind of a neat idea. Uh, and I think it works well for this modular uh, chassis, which uh, will be able to span tons of future EVs uh, into the future for Mercedes-Benz. So that's pretty neat. Interestingly as well, the battery management system is all developed in-house, which gives Mercedes total control over the battery pack. And it's all also able to be updated over the air. So if you wanted to change your charging curve, if you wanted to increase usable capacity later on in the vehicle's life, uh, if there are certain thermal uh, conditions where they're able to open it up, for example, allow the battery pack to regen or charge faster under colder temperatures, these can all be updated over the air over time, which is really neat and uh, will be really useful if you're thinking about buying a car. If you think about keeping a car a long time over the air, updates to almost every module on the vehicles are very important for an EV because most automakers are very conservative at launch and then they'll open things up as it goes and they have more data from the field. Cool idea. Uh, lithium ion pack, of course, 
eight part nickel, one part manganese, one part cobalt. So 10% of the active materials cobalt, which is really low considering modern standards. We'll see future battery pack technology come with probably uh, even less cobalt, even down to cobalt free battery packs, but this will come down the road. I think as far as uh, everything uh, going on today, this is fairly good. The battery packs are produced just on the other side of Stuttgart. Don't ask me how to pronounce the name of the city they're pronounced in, but everything uh, comes together in uh, Factory 56 that we talked about. And everything's produced in the same area from uh, uh, battery pack and uh, final assembly, which is pretty neat. In terms of charging, things get pretty interesting. 200 kilowatt peak charging, and I spoke to one of the engineers and he said that pretty much stays flat all the way to 80%. He said it may come off 200, 180, close to 80%, but at least the initial reports sound like the charging curve is gonna be fantastic. So the peak charging rate, 200 kilowatts, awesome. Yeah. Really good number. I think that that's a super great target. Yeah. Uh, but for from from what percentage? Because the curve also matters. So yeah. this is obviously from down low. And then when does it appreciably pull off 200 kilowatts? Yeah. It's around 30% or 40% or how, how long does it hold? We are, we are address or aim at uh, between 20 and 80. So in a really very long um, window or a very large window of the um, battery, of course that depends on temperature um, and stuff like that. But we want to have that not only as a short peak, because that's uh, only worth something on the paper, but really sure. um, to have that very constantly. In terms of charging on AC power, it's 40 amp or 9.6 kilowatts. Again, this could be for the European versions. We'll see what the US cars come with, but 9.6 kilowatts on a car this big with that big of a battery pack is about, what, 12 hours for a full charge from zero on AC. I think this really needs closer to 80 amp onboard charging. If it's gonna truly be the S class of EV, these, it needs a, you know, a 19 kilowatt onboard charger or something like this. So we'll see. Uh, the vehicle is also plug-in charge capable. So when you plug into an Electrify America charge point station, you get the car hooked up for the first time. All the apps are uh, connected on the back end. Ideally, you'll plug in and it'll just VIN recognition and charge and then charge your account, which is neat. Uh, Mercedes has a service called Mercedes Me Charge. And I'm trying to figure out if this is for the European market or for the US market as well but it comes included for two years. And honestly, I tried to read through everything and ask around. I don't know if this car will come with free two years of charging, but at least based on the material I'm reading, it shows that that's the case. So we'll definitely see, and I'll update you over time. Uh, there's also eco charging functionality that will reduce the load of charging. It's a setting uh, to slow down the aging process of the battery pack, which is natural. Of course, all batteries will degrade and you can also schedule your charging to happen during certain hours of the day to take advantage of cheaper electricity rates. Battery seems pretty good. You know, I think the Mercedes is taking a huge focus on thermal management as well as uh, charge rate. So they want you to really spend the least amount of time at the charger possible. If you look at WLTP efficiency rating, uh, this car can add 300 kilometers of range in 15 minutes, which is really interesting. I don't think you're gonna get 470 miles on a charge in the EPA cycle. So we'll take a look at to see, uh, you know, how many miles it adds in rated miles per minute and how well this car does and its efficiency during our own 70 mile per hour highway testing that I run every EV through, but at least everything's looking really good here and have to say, um, th this is really awesome guys. Mercedes, I think is doing a great job with this battery pack design, this modular architecture. Uh, while I believe the, modul the, the, the modules do take up space and complexity for uh, ground up EVs specific for their chassis, uh, Daimler really has tons of different models that they need to make EVs for, and this is probably the correct approach to break the batteries into modules and then have the BMS all controlling everything. So pretty neat. Let's talk about range and how the car gets that range. So 770 kilometers or 478 miles on the WLTP cycle. This is aided by the 0 0.20 coefficient of drag, uh, which is just insanely low. And we'll get into styling in a little bit, but the, the drag of the vehicle has so much to play into the range. So CD value of 0 0.20, uh, this is achieved with the 19 inch AMG wheel and tire combo and only in sport driving mode. 
mode. And sport driving mode lowers the car all the way down, of course. And uh, the 19 inch wheels, I believe, are the smallest wheels you can get, uh, at least the most aero designed ones. There's other things that go into styling that we'll get into, but it has seamless door, uh, door handles, which is really neat. And then, um, you know, just huge steps to reduce wind noise, NVH, all throughout the car. And this is all a benefit, of course, of a lower CD is the car's going to be really quiet because it's slippery. So you have a flat windscreen, this one bow design that goes across a really smooth underbody. Uh, you have a lower cooling requirement for an, for an EV, especially while just cruising. So the louvers on the front can remain closed so the car can have the air deflected around as much as possible, which is really neat. And uh, for the first First time ever, there are six side windows in a Mercedes, but everything is just super, super flat. So we'll get into more of the NVH later on, but the CD value really leads to an amazing highway range, I suspect. Now, what's powering this vehicle is hugely important the as well. The EQS drives pleasantly quietly. This is made possible by the intelligent design and construction of the electric drivetrain, the arrangement of the elastomer bearings and support frames, as well as the sound insulation of the electric powertrain. The drive noises and vibrations are optimally isolated. Silence as luxury becomes the guiding principle of the new EQS. The four-wheel drive with two E-engines are harmoniously coordinated. Depending on the driving requirements, both drive modules are intelligently combined for optimal performance and efficiency. The result? Long range with strong performance. The enhanced developed eco-assistant detects the route and supports the driver with intelligent recuperation. Whenever the situation allows, the system changes to sailing mode. Thus, the EQS drives almost without any energy usage. The Eco Assistant analyzes traffic situations, gradients, vehicles ahead and speed limitations and supports the driver in anticipatory driving. Thanks to the intelligent recuperation strategy, the EQS relieves the driver from braking and, depending on the situation, stops automatically when vehicles ahead are detected. So you can have up to 385 kilowatts of power, which is 516 horsepower. Uh, you can have as low as 329 horsepower if you opt for just the rear wheel drive version. Now, I imagine there will be a performance version with well over 516 horsepower coming down the road, but we don't have any details on that. So I believe they're calling this the EQS 400 or 450, somewhere around there. I, I don't know the exact naming yet, but I think it's the EQS 450 is what they're calling this one. Uh, again, rear wheel drive is standard, 4MATIC all wheel drive optional, uh, and um, 130 mile an hour top speed, which is quite low uh, given Taycan can do 167. Now, I, I would have expected a higher top speed from the Germans on something like this. Again, being a, an EQS, an S class level vehicle, they're has to be almost no compromise and the 130 mile per hour top speed especially for the germans might be a pretty big compromise I, i'm i'm curious as to why that's the case uh, they did not want to go with the two-speed transmission in this vehicle like porsche has done so maybe that has something to do with it uh, you have two permanent magnet motors and they have uh, pull-in stator windings for a really strong magnetic field the it also has a, an interesting stator tilt function that has windings that are not totally um, uh, coherent. Basically, they all go in different directions, and this helps reduce motor cogging at low speed. The rear motor is also a little bit more powerful because it operates in a six-phase operation, which is two windings with three phases each, reducing cogging and, of course, increasing performance, uh, while also decreasing um, uh, uh, waste heat, which is really neat. They have a really uh, sophisticated thermal concept for high load capacity and multiple accelerations with uh, consistency, basically. So you can just wide open throttle this thing over and over and over, and uh, Mercedes claims that they will keep it uh, cool. And so how are they keeping it cool? They have a uh, water lance in the shaft of the rotor that cools the rotor. The stator has ribs all around it, which is super neat. It has a needle-shaped pin-fin structure on the in 
inverter. The transmission has a separate oil cooler, which helps keep the transmission fluid for the single gear reduction at a good temperature. It also helps for warming up the gear oil in uh, cold weather operation. Of course, EVs are still less efficient in the cold, and that's because there's fluids and things that need to come up to temperature, of course, you need to burn heat. Uh, the Formatic system features a torque shift function, function that will distribute uh, torque and power front to rear axle uh, individually. It will monitor this 10,000 times per minute. And uh, of course, Mercedes will use this to optimize to have the most efficient motor in the given scenario. So for example, I don't know what the gear ratios are front and rear, but let's just say the front motor is optimized for highway efficiency. It will prioritize torque to that motor for highway cruising, which could be interesting. Uh, Mercedes has done a ton of testing, millions of miles of testing on e-drive test benches at two separate facilities around the world. They've also done vehicle testing globally. Uh, you know, the Germans are obsessive about testing their vehicles. So S-Class has been on probably every continent or close to it. Uh, and they've done special hot and cold weather testing for the power electronics, just because you have to imagine this is an entirely new chassis for the Germans, uh, for, for Daimler. And so everything is new. So everything needs to be retested. It's not like they can harvest this module and this wiring harness from the combustion S-Class. This is new ground up, so everything needs testing. And it's really tough uh, to get all this done and done correctly. We wouldn't be evaluating an EV if we didn't talk about the regeneration and the relationship between the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal. So, uh, sounds like there will be three different regen strength settings, and these are controlled with steering wheel paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Uh, it will also be situational optimized with the help of eco assistance. So uh, you, I assume there'll be an auto mode where it will coast down hills if you're trying to extend your range or if the car in front of you is slowing down, it will increase regen. Uh, neat in, in D auto mode. Now I haven't played around with the car. I don't know all of the modes, but uh, it will give you 0.5 G of off throttle deceleration. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, but 0.31 G of that is made up from regen and 0.22 G of that is friction braking. Now those don't quite add up. It's because I converted them from feet per second squared into G uh, to make it hopefully easier for you to understand. But basically what this is saying is tons of regen off the accelerator pedal, and it can even come all the way to a stop using this one pedal driving mode. Uh, I did mention though, 290 kilowatt peak regen. That's awesome. Now I spoke to one of the engineers in a video that we just put up on Inside EV's YouTube channel. He claimed 200 kilowatts of regen. The technical material claims 290. Not sure who to believe. I'm going to go with the technical material, though, uh, because uh, that that's a huge number. If that's the case, that's the most amount of regen to any car that we've heard about so far. Uh, the second closest regen would be 265 kilowatt regen from a Taycan. Mercedes also claims that you can do this with the rear wheel drive version, but your traction limited. So basically, you'll just use all of that rear axle uh, for regen and probably never even use the friction brakes on the back. That's pretty wild. So sounds like they're going to optimize all of the regen to have a coasting setting, a mild setting, an automatic setting, and of course a really strong off throttle uh, blended regen and friction braking. I'm going to assume that the brake pedal will also blend friction brakes in after regen. So we'll have to test that brake pedal calibration when we have a chance to drive this car but I think they're taking a good approach. So the Europeans really love this blended braking on the brake pedal. Actually, almost everyone does, but Tesla, I still think Tesla has the correct approach, which is give you all the regen off the accelerator pedal and keep the braking system a hydraulic system. It feels the most natural, it's the least complicated, uh, and, and I think it's probably the, the best solution, really. But I understand where they have a lot of uh, uh, buyers that are gonna be first-time EV owners that won't necessarily like the feeling of regen off the accelerator pedal and in the case of a Tesla if you have the car in in regen on low hitting the brake pedal doesn't increase the recuperation forces so this is probably their best compromise for efficiency and I understand why they took this approach uh, you know what powers the car you know what uh, charging the car but how does this all come together on a road trip which arguably is the most important part I think uh, to EV ownership and that's purely because 
the one time you may go on a trip, the car needs to be really good. So uh, let's, uh, let's dive into what it's like to road trip an EQS. The cloud-based navigation with electric intelligence calculates proactively and continuously the energy requirements in order to determine the optimal route. The topography, route, surrounding temperature, speed, and the charging infrastructure are constantly being analyzed. If the driver wants additional reserves at the planned charging stations, he can set this individually. He does not need to worry about the range. The charging system of the EQS is designed for all common charging options. From the household socket to the quick charging station with plug and charge. Charging is possible almost anywhere. Through Mercedes Me Charge, Mercedes EQ customers have direct access to more than 500,000 charging points worldwide. Bidirectional charging makes it possible for the first time to pass the energy from the battery onto other consumers. This turns the car into an electricity supplier. For example, for your own house. Mercedes calls this navigation system navigation with electric intelligence. So it means they're really putting a big emphasis on correct and accurate EV route planning. Not much can be said about this other than Tesla, really. I've tested almost every EV. The Taycan comes close, uh, but, but this uh, navigation with electric intelligence sounds like it takes it even a step farther. So it will plan routes, uh, including charging stops, and here's every Everything that it calculates, elevation, ambient temperature, speed, heating, cooling demands, traffic on planned route, and charging stations uh, based on charging speed and payment function. So for example, if you have two uh, separate 350 kilowatt locations in the same spot, it will prioritize the one that can use plug and charge functionality. Really neat, actually. Uh, the system will respond dynamically to traffic changes or your driving style, or if you crank the heater to high, uh, it'll say, okay, maybe we'll pull you in a stop early if you change, or if you start to drive more efficiently, maybe it can extend you farther to the next charging stop. So that's really neat. So many EVs will calculate your trip plan at the start of the trip, and then it just tries to stick with that for the entire thing, but it's a dynamic situation going on a long stretch that could be over a thousand miles in some cases. So I really like this. All of the calculations done uh, in the cloud and on board. So even if you don't have cell service, it will work, but it sounds like it will be optimized better if you have a cell connectivity. So that's pretty neat. Uh, and it also allows the user to individually edit the route. For example, if it chooses a charging station you don't like, you can say, nope, remove that one, go to a another one. That's really cool. Uh, and it will also allow you to choose the battery power reserve at the charger and the final destination. So if you're going to go on a trip that's, you know, across the country, you can say, I want to pull into chargers at 10% or 5% state of charge. And when we get a chance to road trip the EQS, of course, we're going to, you know, look at the charging curve and figure out what the exact best way to road trip the car is. But I love that you can adjust it and it's all done through this giant hyper screen that we'll talk about as well. So another neat thing is if you, you can select in the car that you have charging at the end destination. For example, you're staying at a hotel with a destination charger or your end destination is home where you have a level two charging station, you can just say pull in dead. And uh, that'll just you know optimize the amount of time that you are driving on the road and not overcharging for any reason. So I really love that. The car will also provide visualization and graphics to show if the battery, or I should say if your range is sufficient to get to your destination and then back. So it will factor in multi-stop basically back to your starting point, which is really nice. Uh, you can, of course, uh, have your favorited charging stations preferred along the route. All of this can be uh, chosen. And then if for whatever reason that you're not able to make it to the charger, let's say you get a ton of headwind or you start driving uh, quickly, the car will suggest for you to switch to eco driving mode and will even give you tips as to how to make it to the charger or, or find you backup options. I think that's really a great, great solution. And something I think is neat that we're going to have to try out is it's going to calculate the charging costs based on your route plan. So 
It sounds like the car is really going to do a ton to help with road trips, and this could be the first integrated route planner in a production electric vehicle that's not from Tesla that actually works. And I'm very much looking forward to trying this out, and I love that Mercedes is making this such a huge deal, putting it at the top of press releases, talking about their uh, intelligent uh, navigation with electric intelligence is what, it, what it's called, because it tells me that they get it. Uh, they understand the hand holding process that many people need on a road trip. Finding stations, telling them how long you need to charge at that individual station, uh, guiding them as to which stations to use and when. So all seems pretty neat. So just to wrap up all of the EV side, you know, I really approach cars in a few different ways, but one of the pillars I dig deep into with EVs is how is it as an electric car? So you need to think about battery charging rate, you need to think about regen rate, you need to think about uh, usable capacity versus installed capacity, over the air updatable to every module on the vehicle, things that would make a really good electric car really good. <laughs> and uh, I gotta say, it sounds like the EQS uh, really has nailed it, at least on the specs, I think. Uh, nothing extraordinary here in terms of charge rate, 200 kilowatts isn't crazy, but it sounds like the charging curve is gonna be really good. And that may make this one of the best and ultimate EV road trippers. So I'm very much looking forward to trying this car out on the EV side, but now it's time to dive into the touch points. How is this as a car rather than just an electric car? And man, does it have a lot to live up to because it has an S in the name. This needs to be the ultimate electric sedan, luxury sedan that happens to be electric. And so what have the Germans done to make it look the part, feel the part, and uh, have the technology to back up everything S-Class has stood for over the years? Let's dive into it. Now the EQS in its full exterior form has not been released yet. That's really the last thing we have yet to see from the new EQS is the finalized exterior design. But we have some words, we have some B-roll, we have some photos, we can get a general idea of what this car is gonna look like through the camouflage. And uh, you have to keep in mind the EQS is a close relative to the full combustion S-Class. However, it is built on an entirely ground up all electric architecture. So it's very different. You have to think of this as the S class of electric cars, not necessarily an electrified S class. So totally new design concept here. And, and the biggest one is a, a one bow design uh, that is uh, ju just amazing because what this is, is it's essentially a singular curvature from almost the hood all the way down to a sloping fastback design. So this one bow uh, design also stretching out the cabin means you have a cab forward uh, a, a design, also a very curved roof. And it kind of looks like this. It looks like a magic mouse. And uh, my friend Ben made this comparison. He's like, all right, you can have this one. It's pretty good actually. The EQS also has the lowest coefficient of drag of any series production vehicle in history. You have to imagine, this is a big luxury sedan with quite a large frontal area, but it has a 0 0.20 drag coefficient, which is insane. Now this is only achieved in sport mode with the 19 inch AMG wheels in particular, but it sounds like the rest of the versions will be relatively slippery depending on the spec. They all will be pretty good. In terms of overall design, we're gonna have to wait till we see it truly in person to come up with final impressions and assumptions with the camouflage all removed. But overall, it's a very curvy vehicle. You can see the hood slats are curved down, so there's very few panel gaps that are actually visible. This required a whole new technology in stamping uh, the entire clamshell bonnet, which is really neat. It also has really only one curvature line, and that's the rear shoulder. It uh, has a Z shape, so when the light hits it, you can have a really nice reflection. But the rest of this car is really swoopy and orby type uh, type of look. Uh, I had the chance to speak to Robert Lesnick, who's head of exterior design, and they followed the process of progressive luxury. This was their tagline to build the entire vehicle off of. The EQS is quite a tall vehicle, so he was saying the one bow design really helps lower the actual visual look of the EQS, even though it's quite high up. 
There are star patterns throughout the vehicle, not just here on the camouflage. And uh, it, it's kind of neat. I, look, personally, I'm going to wait till I see it in person to reserve final judgment, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. It's a huge departure from Mercedes in the past. There's almost no crease lines on this entire vehicle. It's very aero focused. And personally, it doesn't excite me, but again, I haven't seen it in person and I'm looking forward to it. Now, take a look at those rear tail lights just there. You can see they're a helix shape in 3D. The headlights as well have really nice daytime running lights. The final production version will have three dots connected with a really nice light signature. Um, really nice. It's a uh, enormous wheelbase on this car. Wheels pushed all the way to the edges, maximizing the interior volume. It's a little bit shorter than the combustion S class, but it retains more interior space, which is really nice. So overall, looking forward to hearing what you guys think about the exterior. Let's dive into what we know though, and that is the interior. The interior of the EQS is where the car needs to truly shine. Uh, it needs to basically display that it's a car of superior quality to anything else on the road, regardless if it's electric or not. Uh, Mercedes-Benz approached this uh, with the theory of embodiment of progressive luxury. Of course, the sensual purity, uh, beauty, and extraordinary mindsets that we talked about from the exterior design carry forwards, but it needs to be uh, modern and uh, come feel like it's coming from the future, but also harken back to the past with really nice touch points, high quality leather, uh, and wood materials if you don't want that giant uh, hyper screen, which you don't have to get. Quite a bit to go through here, and uh, it's really going to be quite interesting. The biggest shock to me, or, or I think to anyone looking at the interior of the EQS, is the hyper screen. Now, we're going to go in depth on just that screen in a little bit, but the first thing that I noticed that I think our viewership will want to know is it's not a giant screen. <laughs> It's got three screens behind it. So you have one for the passenger, one for the center of the car, and one for the driver. And it's huge, it's really neat. We'll talk about how they design the glass, the processing power behind the screen, uh, but it is not one giant screen. It's one giant piece of glass that then house multiple screens behind. So that can be kind of interesting. The outer vents are uh, turbine blades that feed the air right to you. And I think it's such a great contrast between those blades and this giant glass panel because being a Mercedes, being an S-Class, it can't all be techie. We, you know, part of what I want to see in a car personally are these really fine, high craftsmanship details, and uh, you know, those air vents are are perfect. Uh, now, in terms of interior space, the entire car is a little bit shorter than S Class, but has more interior volume. Part of that's just because of they were have, able to have that cab forward design. Of course, having uh, everything pushed to the edges, but you're going to have uh, no transmission tunnel, which means you'll have tons of extra storage throughout the vehicle. Uh, of course, you'll have flowing leather surfaces and intricate seam patterns to really bring together uh, that classical design that we really look for. Uh, there's two seats that you can choose from in this car, the comfort seats or the sport seats. The comfort seats uh, come with the electric art design and equipment line. I'm not sure if this is for the US spec cars. Sometimes the German spec vehicles and the US spec cars have different lines. But uh, for example, like you can get a C-Class avant-garde line in Germany, but we just have like the, the comfort or the sport. <laughs> so we'll see what comes through, but I'm pretty sure we'll have an AMG line interior regardless. And that comes with the sport seat. The comfort seats are basically just one big flat slab of seat, very simplistic, uh, but they have uh, wraparound surfaces and uh, they provide good body support, which is nice. 12 different, maybe 10 different massage profiles in this seat. You can do hot stone massage as well. Really nice, gotta love that. The sport seats are slim and monolithic in shape, and they are designed in such a way to give the impression of draped on leather blankets. Yeah, the, see, I'll, I just, look, I just want the seats to feel good and hold me in and uh, will be kind of neat. Uh, you know, they have really neat perforations and highly de uh, deliberate graphic patterns uh, throughout the seat. So who knows, maybe it looks good. 
We'll play around with it. I think it's a gorgeous looking interior. I think the coolest part about this interior is the ambient lighting. So you can have, uh, we'll get into it, but you can have lights all around the seats, which are really nice. Like the speaker grills are outlined at, at when it's dark out, this backlighting really is just absolutely amazing. And there's some new materials as well. There's something called Neotex, uh, which is uh, basically, it looks like Nubuck leather, um, but but it sort of feels like high-tech neoprene, and this will be across the dash. The new Land Rover Defender has a similar material. I thought it was really high quality. Every Mercedes EQ will also have a rose gold uh, accent line going across the dashboard, which I think looks great, and that's regardless of color. Um, and it's supposed to be derived and evolved from the electric coil. <laughs> okay, well, there's eight color combinations you can get inside. They're all coordinated between a mix of warm and cool tones. Uh, so you'll have, for example, the sable brown Neva gray and then the space gray macchiato beige. Uh, combinations as contrasting. Those are two examples, of course. Kind of neat. You can get wood trim or you can get like this futuristic trim stuff. Honestly, just play around with the configurator, I think, when it goes live and figure out what you like. I, every single piece has a story about how it was crafted and designed and came up with. And it, it's all really neat. They put a lot of work into it. it I have a hard time explaining uh, uh, touch and feel points, of course, when I haven't sat in the car. So we'll play around with it, but we can get as much as we want. Now, what we can talk about are the graphics and displays uh, that will be coming in. So, uh, the color themes for the displays are a new color world of blue and orange throughout all of the displays. So this is a new uh, style for Mercedes-Benz. Take a look at this video that I'm playing right now. You can kind of see how when you hit the acceleration pedal, you get this wave that comes out on the power and then you get this G-meter puck in the middle. This is the sporty display. It's a three-dimensional performance bar. So you can see the drive, acceleration, and charge. Of course, you can see that G-force puck, but there's three different main modes you can have. The understated, the sporty, and the classic. Um, and the one we're looking at here, of course, is the sporty. So I don't know what the other ones look like, but I'm hoping pretty interesting. Uh, there's three modes within those three themes that you can have, uh, or three display styles, and that's navigation, assistance, or service. I would probably have it in uh, uh, assistance, which will basically show you cars around you, lane markings, uh, things like this, and uh, other road users. And it will distinguish between cars, motorcycles, and trucks, and pedestrians, of course, which is neat. You can get two different sizes of head-up display, ranging from pretty large to absolutely massive. And I'm pretty sure it's 77 inches. Yes, yeah, 77 inches diagonal heads up display 3D. I mean, if that's like fills up the entire windshield, that's incredible. I can't wait to try that out. It is the, uh, I believe the largest augmented head up display uh, in any automotive world. So the from a display perspective, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the hyperscreen, but in terms of the information that's going to be displayed to you, you have the driver instrument cluster, you have the heads-up display projecting that massive image. Uh, again, that's for the largest heads-up display. I don't know the cross-sectional size of the smaller head-up display. You have the center uh, navigational map that will be just to the right of you. And you can see that now in a video clip I'm playing. And then you'll have a separate passenger display all the way on the right that you can put on a picture. Uh, and I'm not sure what else you can do over there, but I know there's a uh, user programmable modes that you can do things with on that side. So all seems pretty neat from a display technology, what you're going to be seeing. But Mercedes is really focused on sound as well. So of course you can have a visual, uh, 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 you know, we went through the touch, you know, which is the seating, the materials, stuff that I don't know how to explain to you until I feel it. We went through what the interior is going to be displaying to you. And then of course you need to see the auditory experience. And this is going to be quite interesting because they've gone to great lengths to reduce NVH in this car. There's a special foam mount, uh, foam mat, excuse me, around all of the uh, motors which is really interesting. They also use NVH optimized arrangement of magnets inside 
of the rotors known as a sheet metal cut. It reduces the use of rare earth materials at the same time, which is quite interesting. The inverter cover is made of a three metal and plastic layer, so you have a really thick inverter cover, and so you don't get that high-pitched squealing noise that quite a lot of electric cars have. They've put in acoustic foam that's built into the body in white, uh, which is crazy. And then the tailgate itself, because it's quite large, is going to have two acoustic uh, dividers to reduce the level of booming noise that is also common with hatchbacks and quite large tailgates in electric cars. So, so real big focus here on quieting down the car. However, then they kind of said, well, maybe it's a little bit too quiet. So they've added something called the acoustic experience, the sound experiences. So you have a sound system in the car, of course, which is a Burmester uh, 15 speaker, 750 watt system. Burmester is one of the leading names in high-end audio from an automotive source. I used to own a Porsche with a Burmester sound system in it and it was truly incredible. Uh, but that had almost twice the output power as this car did. So, you know, with, with less exterior road noise means you need less uh, amplifier power to push into the car. So we'll see how that plays through and what it sounds like when we're able to drive it. But essentially, you'll have multiple soundscapes that you can choose from, and soundscapes will be sort of the theme for what everything sounds like. So you'll have something called Silver Waves and Vivid Flux, and Vivid Flux is like aimed at the EV enthusiast. It makes like cool sword noises and Jetsons noises and all this stuff. I don't know. Personally, I would turn all of this off, but maybe it's actually pretty good. Uh, you know, we'll have to try it before I say anything, you know, that that's really too bad. I think it's a little gimmicky, but it is uh, implemented in a way where it doesn't seem too intrusive. Take a listen to the vivid flux uh, when uh, Fabian here floors it in the EQS. You see in the instrument cluster, a subtle supporting sound of um, the torque of the power coming from uh, the motors. So the sound is a, an algorithm that was created by the 250 sound engineers inside of Mercedes. Uh, it's rendered in 3D, so the sound thro flows through the entire cabin. You won't really be able to pinpoint a speaker within the cabin uh, that it's coming from. So I think that's kind of neat. We'll have to see how true that is, but I know they spent a lot of time uh, basically designing these sound algorithms in-house uh, to make it all happen. It's a uh, DSP concept audio weaver are the uh, uh, tools they use to make these algorithms work. And uh, the pedestrian warning sound is unchanged from EQC. However, there are other sounds produced on the outside of the car. And this is a basic aura. Uh, you, first off, when you lock and unlock the car, you're acoustically approached with the, you know, a couple noises. I don't know what they sound like, but you get this aura when you are around the exterior of the EQS. And, and what I can, I don't know how to explain it because I don't know what it sounds like, but it's supposed to give you this, this feeling when you're just standing around the car because it's just humming away at you, I guess. I have no idea. Uh, so that'll be kind of neat. And, uh, yeah, kind of, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think these EV sounds are silly? Do you think they're not silly if they're implemented very well? This isn't just like a Jaguar I-Pace or Tycon like sound generator when you floor it. This is like so much goes into this. Uh, 12 different sensors adjust the sound based on the driving experience to make it feel more comfortable and more, I guess, not weird to be driving an EV. I don't know. Uh, apparently you, they'll be able to design more of these and you can download them over time to have more fun. So what do you think? Do you want your sound designs inside the EQS or do you want the pure quiet driving experience? The good news is you can turn all this off. I think they spent a lot of time on this though. So I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it out and seeing if it's something I actually like. Generally, I'm a purist and if the car's a V8, I wanna hear the noises the engine makes. Don't pipe in fake sound. And if it's an electric car, I want to hear the electric wine. If there is no electric wine, I don't want to hear anything. So, you know, I drive a, a, an i3. At, we have one in the garage, and it is the quietest electric car I've ever driven. You really can't hear any electric noise on the inside, and it's quite nice. So maybe that will be the case for the S-Class. Maybe you just kick it on when you want to go shred up a back road in that, uh, I don't know, fancy mode that makes it seem like you're driving on volcanoes. And yeah, seems pretty neat. However, 
Now we need to get into the interior's party piece for safety uh, and also health, which is the HEPA air filtration system. Now, uh, not to ignore Tesla, who's done uh, uh, bioweapon defense mode and HEPA filters. I owned a Model S with that filter. That was really cool. And you really do notice the difference. And uh, the EQS is, is pretty similar here, but, it, but I think they take it even a step farther. Now, I'll have to wait for some of the... Uh, air quality engineers to comment. I'd love for you to reach out to me directly. I can send you some of the technical material I have on this HEPA filter. I'm gonna hit you with quite a bit here, but it sounds like Mercedes went so far into making sure that the interior remains clean. Uh, like this is insane. So take a, take a listen to all of this stuff. You need to get the Energizing Air Control Plus package. Again, the, the German spec packages are gonna be different from the US spec packages. That'll be all up to the US uh, product planners to say what they want from Germany from the main production line and then they can package the cars accordingly. Uh, but it is the first vehicle, I think, that bears the OFI quality seal ZG 250-1 in the area of viruses and bacteria protection. Now to me as just the person off the street, I have no idea what that means, but again I'm sharing this because I think it's really interesting. You also get in the MBUX, whether it's the hyper screen or just the main screen, uh, that, that's Mercedes-Benz user experience is what that stands for. You get particulate levels displayed in real time, which is so neat. And this will display particulate levels inside the vehicle and outside. And that's something I would be really curious to see because when you drive through a really dirty city, I'm always like, how bad truly is the air? Uh, so here you'd be able to know at least. You can also pre-clean the interior air before getting into the vehicle by preconditioning it. Also adjust the temperature, of course. And the HEPA filters dimension, which is underneath the front hood, are 23 inches by 16 inches by 1.6 and its volume is almost three gallons. And so you have three filters, including this HEPA filter, that run through the entire car. You have a coarse pre-filter that retains leaves and snow and sand and traps larger particulates. And then you have a synthetic membrane, and this is a microfiber layer, traps fine dust and the so-called class PM 2.5 to PM 0.3. So these particles are trapped uh, that are smaller than 2.5 micrometers. And over 99.65% of all particles of all sizes are removed according to the filter's efficiency, which are certified pursuant to the DIN EN 1822. This must be what people hear when they hear me talk about electric battery stuff, because I don't, all I'm hearing is this must be a really clean interior, but hey, look, I really want to share this info with you, and uh, it's something I'm curious about learning more too is, is air quality and things like this. So basically what this all boils down to is the interior is going to have the, the, reduction, the reduction of pollutants comparable to that in clean rooms and operating rooms, which I think is, is really neat. There's a third and final filter as well that is going to filter out sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and unpleasant odors. And this is going to have special activated charcoals in the HEPA filter and cabin filter. And uh, you have about 21 ounces of activated charcoal with an absorption area, I think it's adsorption area, equivalent to 150 football fields which just seems like a lot. <laughs> and the activated charcoal is produced from coconut shells, which are a byproduct of the cosmetics industry. Which, so that's kind of neat. So you're able to reuse stuff that's left over. Love that. Again, the package is called Energizing Air Control Plus. And the, uh, if you have it on recirculating air, the air conditioned recirculating air is filtered several, several times and then flushed with uh, fresh air at uh, regular intervals, which I think is quite nice. And then on top of all of that clean air, you can of course use any of the existing Mercedes-Benz fragrances. I have somewhere, maybe Ben has it, my friend Ben who I was talking about, we have a fragrance sample kit of the Mercedes-Benz fragrances available. However, they developed an entirely new fragrance for the EQS that is purchasable, and it's part of the air balance package. Again, it might come standard in the US, I'm not sure how the cars will be optioned, um, but it's called number 
number six mood linen. And the reason that it's called number six is it's the first electric cars added to the Mercedes-Benz model range were in 1906. And uh, they used electric in-wheel hub motors powered by a battery, of course. They were available as passenger cars, trucks, buses, ambulances, and fire trucks in a wide variety of designs. That's so neat. Love the little bit of history. Uh, the smell is supposed to give you the slight impression of a fig tree standing at a high elevation surrounded by fresh, cool air. I think these people have a lot more time on their hands than they know what to do with, honestly. But uh, this is just the case of car design in Germany. It's extremely over-engineered. And look, personally, I love it. I love all these little touches and you need an hour long video, if not more, just to get through half of the stuff in the technical briefing that they gave me. Trust me, I'm leaving out a whole bunch as well, um, but I'm trying to hit the high points. This is super neat. Let's jump into energizing comfort. If you spec the energizing package, which again, packages will be different, you get something called energizing comfort. And this isn't unique to EQS, but it is included. It's also on the current S-Class and I'm trying to think, I just tested a new E-Class that I think had it too. And it's kind of interesting. It's more like a funny thing to me. I don't know. I, 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 when you really spend a lot of time in the cars, I think is where you'll really notice this. But there's a new, uh, a three new energizing nature programs. So you have something called Forest Glades, Sound of the Sea, and Summer Rain. And these are calming sounds uh, in consultation, created in consultation with the acoustic ecologist, Gordon Hempton. And uh, essentially these, are to create lighting moods, pictures on the dash, uh, you know, changes the, the ambient lighting to, I guess, make you feel like you're in the middle of a forest or in the sea or in a summer rain. I don't know. Uh, I'll read you one of these <laughs> things from the press briefing because it's pretty funny. Forest Glade can help you escape the noise, the noisy daily routine and boost concentration. Bird sounds, rustling leaves, and a gentle breeze create a feel-good ambiance. The program is rounded off by warm music soundscapes and subtle fragrance. So you can see it ties together air conditioning systems to blow at waves. You know, we were playing around with this actually today. I have a BMW 5 Series on loan and it has a similar thing. But but aside from this, this is all kind of kind of silly, I think. Um, they're, they're arranged into 10 minute like experiences for each one of these things. But one of them I find pretty interesting is called Power Nap. And uh, whether the system will automatically suggest for you to take a power nap or you suggest the system that you wanna take a nap, basically you pull over to a charging station or a service area, um, and then the car will bring you through three phases of a sleep. Now I'm not sure how long it keeps you asleep for, but if you have like a wearable like a Garmin wearable or a Mercedes-Benz watch, it actually displays your heart rate and sleep status all on the screen and it uses like body algorithm stuff I don't understand to control how you sleep. I don't know, pretty interesting. Anyway, what it'll do is it'll put the seat all the way back, close all the sunshades, um, and it works in three different modes. You have a falling asleep mode, a staying asleep mode, and a waking up mode. And uh, it will keep the uh, condition, uh, the interior condition longer than the combustion vehicles will, of course. Uh, and the EQS ensures a sleep promoting atmosphere by moving the driver's seat, of course, into the resting position, closing the side windows and roller blinds, activating the ionization of the fresh and recirculating air and adjusting the ambient light accordingly. Um, you can do this for the front driver seat or passenger seat, which is pretty neat. And waking up is accompanied by a pleasantly activating soundscape appropriate fragrance, as well as a briefly active, subtle massage and seat ventilation just to get you waking up. See, these, this is just the stuff the Germans do. This is so neat. I love all these things. And, and for me personally, like there's so much, I don't even know how to cover all of this in a review. I mean, you need to be like auto gefool and do two hour long reviews on these cars and may, maybe more, but uh, at least our audience will learn about them here with this video, which is kind of interesting. The, the smartwatch integration where it can uh, monitor pulse rate, stress level, and sleep quality, and then adjust the programs in the car using the artificial intelligence system to make sure that you are prepared or, or handled correctly. I think that's really actually kind of neat. Let me know what you think. 
And welcome to the final module, everything you wanted to know about the MBUX hyperscreen. Now, uh, this is crazy, okay? So this is basically a 56 inch wide piece of glass that had to be formed at 1202 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to create this like visually stunning solid piece across the car. Now, what I originally thought was that the this is one giant display, it's not. It's three displays one for the driver, one central display, and one passenger display. I'll give you the, this is an in-depth video. So the uh, driver display is 12.3 inches. That's an LCD screen, and that is uh, wet bonded to the glass. The central display is 17.7 .7 inches, which is massive, and that is dry bonded, and that's OLED. And the front passenger display is 12.3 inches, again, OLED. Now, um, uh, some some things that are pretty interesting are that there, you can have force uh, feedback as well as haptic touch. So there are 12 vibration motors underneath the screen. Uh, eight of them are in the central display, four of them are in the passenger display, and you basically give this uh, mechanical switch impression when you touch the screen. Most of you have experienced uh, uh, haptic feedback by now, but crazy that they get implemented on something this big. You can also have forced feedback, uh, which is basically done by a metalized foam that's integrated into the device as a force sensor. You can have different levels of pressure on the glass uh, that will change the response of the system. So if you wanna dig deeper into a menu, you just push harder. Uh, should be really neat. I'm excited to see how the software does everything. What I find interesting is there's so much information going on here on this giant display that Mercedes needed to allow the passengers to do something, do some things such as watching movies. They didn't really say that, but I imagine you can watch videos on here. Uh, but they don't want the driver being distracted. So there's a whole bunch of cameras and monitoring systems inside of the car that will uh, determine if the driver is looking at the passenger display and then dim that display down so they can't see what's going on. If the front passenger seat is not occupied, the screen will then just display an image of your choosing. The curved glass is made of scratch resistant aluminum silicate glass and is coated to make cleaning fingerprints easier with just a microfiber cloth, to be expected. There's multiple light sensors as well throughout the car to determine the brightness of the screen. So you don't just have the screen adjusting and dimming, uh, like if you're going through a, 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 an area where the sun is hitting right on the sensor, it brightens up the screen, but it's actually dark outside or vice versa and so you won't have um, uh, scattered light uh, uh, fooling the 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 light sensors and having a mis in misinterpretation of the light and having the screens at the improper brightness, which I just love that they spent the time on all of this stuff. Also, uh, o OLEDs have uh, age-related burn-in effects, and so they thought about this, and they monitor each individual pixel with an algorithm, and they also rotate some of everything around imperceptibly so that you don't have crazy burn-in over time. Really wild. As I mentioned, the glass is formed at a process of up to 1202 Fahrenheit. It's, you know, same process as camera lenses and uh, smartphone glass covers. It enables a distortion-free view of the displays across the entire width of the vehicle. All of the displays are transparently bonded to the cover of the glass to reduce reflections, which of course, uh, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about. And the black areas between the screens are printed onto the cover glass from behind using a screen printing process specially adapted to the curvature. For certain important warning lights like a check engine light or a suspension fault, you can see the cutouts in this for the lights to come through, which is pretty interesting. In terms of crash safetyness, the hyperscreen is bolted directly onto the cockpit cross member. It is a stabilizing magnesium support as the structural component of the MBUX hyperscreen, and the connection is made via aluminum brackets. The honeycomb structure allows them to bend in a controlled manner in the event of a crash, and there's also uh, predetermined uh, breaking points of the glass behind the side air vents if you have a severe side impact. So pretty neat that they really thought about all of this. Now, that's not the only system, of course, uh, in the vehicle that you can choose from. You can option a regular, I believe it's a 12.8 inch display uh, that's very similar to the Combustion S-Class that goes in from, from MBU and uh, the system it functions as normal.
normally. Uh, basically, you're not going to lose functionality going without the hyper screen, and you would also gain some beautiful wood texture uh, w where the hyper screen would be. Personally, it might be what I go for. The hyper screen doesn't excite me that much. I think it's really neat, but I might just go for the normal one, save whatever that option cost is, and get a really nice, um, you know, uh, wood interior <laughs> backing plate, which I think could be quite interesting. All of your menus, everything is right up top, and then you can also have uh, uh, suggestions that the car will make. For example, if you're pulling into a charging station that's enabled for plug-in charge or, or even manual charging, the charging menu will just pop up. If you call someone on Tuesday on your way home from work, it'll pull up their contact card on Tuesday. If you put your heated seat on, it'll suggest for you to put your heated steering wheel on. So many things that this system can suggest that aren't necessarily making you need to go deep into the menus. Uh, it also has GPS uh, linked suspension, which I think is pretty neat. So when you get just the standard 12.8 inch display in the center of the car, that comes equipped with a 12.3 inch driver display uh, in portrait orientation, of course. So there's face recognition in the vehicle with cameras in the driver display, and it's used for driver assistance and uh, biometric authentication, which I think is cool. So you can do fingerprint scanning or face uh, detection, apparently. It will also do use these cameras for fatigue warning and adjusting the exterior mirrors to match where your head is, which I think is a really neat feature. Hey, Mercedes is also now able to recognize people by their voices and then automatically switch to their profile. I imagine they can use the face recognition or fingerprint scanner to match to your profile as well. If you are about to exit the vehicle. There's cameras inside the car, of course, and it knows your hands go in for the door handle. It will warn you at that moment if someone's about to come up and say, hey, don't open the door. Uh, so it uses the blind spot monitoring system to basically stop you from opening the door into a cyclist, for example. Really, really neat stuff and good integration all throughout. I'm really excited to play around with this software in person. I know this was a crazy long video. I only have technical press materials to share with you guys so far, but I know no one else is going to share all of this stuff. So if you're interested in EQS, I hope you stay tuned because we're going to be doing plenty more with the car, I guarantee you. And I'm so excited to uh, get to see this car in person, get to drive it, get to go on a road trip, and of course, share everything we learn. Uh, there's one thing talking about all of these features, which is kind of neat to hear about and, and share with you guys, but it's gonna be a whole nother thing to experience them. And, and it seems like the S-Class, the EQS, is just going to have so many things in it that one, it might be too confusing for most of the people who buy it, uh, I, I'm gonna need more than a week with it just to figure it out, that's for sure. And um, you know, I, I, I love this about the cars because now we're starting to get the best of the combustion vehicles mixed with really good uh, hardware and technology from an electric vehicle all into one. So it's sort of like my world's colliding. You guys know I review all cars and uh, part of me loves electric cars and part of me loves this crazy over-engineering nerdiness with face recognition, turning off the passenger screen when I look over there, stuff that just hasn't even been heard of or in the realm of possibilities for people that are locked in the electric vehicle world. Um, I, I just think it's really awesome that it's all coming together here in the EQS. I'm very excited to uh, spend some time with it. Thanks for watching another Out of Spec Reviews video. Thanks for sticking around. I know this was a long one and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.